I'm going to open the floor for questions and comments. And just one quick reflection before I open the floor. I mean, I totally agree with Michelle about the notion of a perception of crisis. And I think part of that perception is that um, migration is predominantly from, from the south to the north. And as uh, Michelle has just reminded us, in fact, the largest movements of people are within the south. And therefore, I'd particularly welcome any comments from members of the uh, audience here today from the global south who want to uh, give us their reflection on the issues that have been raised uh, in the two excellent presentations we've just heard. So um, does anybody have a microphone on them? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to the gentleman in the front row, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Thomas Sama, and uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Helsinki in social sciences. Now, I want to ask, ask a question to Michelle and to San Jola. First, uh, I think we are very, or I am personally very happy to have Michelle, uh, Michelle here. I mean, uh, she's fresh from the United Nations in New York, and I see her here as some sort of a representative or the voice of the UN Secretary General. Now, Michelle, um, my question to you is that um, during the UN summit, I followed the discussion of two presidents, two head of states at the migration summit. The president of my country, Paul Bia, who spoke extensively about the refugee situation in Cameroon, because in Cameroon, at our region, we have uh, war going on caused by Boko Haram. So refugees from the Central African, African Republic where there is crisis, they are in Cameroon, over 200,000. Refugees from Nigeria fleeing from Boko Haram, we know about the 200 girls who were abduct, uh, abducted, they are in Cameroon, from Chad and from other countries. So Cameroon is facing a big refugee problem. So our president spoke about that at the UN and he made mention of the fact that a lot of you know, assistance and cooperation is needed from other countries to solve this problem. The next president I, I followed up his uh, speech and discussion extensively was the president of Turkey. The president of Turkey talked about how there, there are a lot of Syrian refugees in Turkey and that the European Union made promises that they were going to give Turkey some money, some aid to fight this uh, refugee situation from Syria but that nothing has been done and that there is uh, supposed to be more commitment. Now my question is, um, Michelle just said that the heads of states took a commitment to address the refugee problem with a new approach. My question is, what, what is there going to be new in terms of the approach to curb the res refugee problem? Uh, the rich countries going to be more committed in fighting this problem. The poor countries or the countries from the south where the refugees, most of them are coming from, I think some of them are willing to cooperate, but they need a lot of assistance from the rich countries. Even within Europe, many of the countries along the Mediterranean, like Greece, are suffering and Spain, they are suffering a lot from the refugee problems. And at times, it's like the other European countries that are far away from the Mediterranean. They say, that's not our problem. That, that's not our problem. And Greece, you know, and uh, Italy, with uh, Lampedusa, very close by in Italy, they are suffering a lot from the problem. So what is, I mean, what kind of commitment do we think is going to uh, bring a new approach? And, and uh, since uh, Michelle is from the UN, does Michelle think that in the next coming years, things are going to change for good? That's my question for Michelle. Then my question for Sanjola is, uh, is that, um, in terms of uh, refugees that have been displaced by, by for example, uh, natural disasters, it happened in Japan and uh, in Indonesia and other countries, we saw it. Most of the time when this happens, um, the, the countries of the North, like the USA, Canada, and uh, France, they send for their citizens to be repatriated. Now, what happens to those citizens who are not able to be repatriated because Maybe they come from the south where they don't have any support for repatriation. Who is responsible for repatriating them? Who is responsible to protect their rights? If we look around very well today, we would see that people in vulnerable situations do not even have any right. So what is the current situation? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Two excellent questions, and I'm going to 
pass them straight over to our two guest speakers. Michelle. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for both of your, both of your questions. Um, let me start with your second one first, and Sanjula may want to add to that. I think uh, certainly IOM's experience, uh, not only with Libya, but now with Yemen, is that there's a recognition that not all countries have the ability to um, evacuate or repatriate their nationals, and that there needs to be international support for that. And fortunately, donors are coming forward. When governments ask IOM to help assist get their, their, their nationals to safety, we've been able to raise donor funding to support that, both from the central UN's emergency fund, but also as a result of the Libya crisis, IOM created its own migration emergency funding mechanism precisely for that purpose, because you can't wait to, for donors to come forward. When you're talking about people's lives, you need to act right away. And the idea was to create a standing funding mechanism. So any request that came in for repatriation or evacuation could be addressed immediately. And, and that is what's happening in, in Yemen now and in some of the other situations. We need to make sure that it's more widely known and that it's able to operate. In Yemen, we are able to evacuate and repatriate but only between bombings. So only when we get notice from the authorities that there's a cessation of the bombings and we'll have a two hour window to quickly go in, pull people out, and then uh, try to get them to a safe place for, for all. So it's, there's still a long way to go on that. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, just, just a few other thoughts on that. Um, I talked about the fact that there are four stakeholders um, that are the target of these guidelines. And it's for reasons like this that we've targeted the guidelines to four separate stakeholders. So you talked about rich countries being able to evacuate their own citizens and others who, are, who have less resources not being able to do it. But there are examples in, in the context of Libya, in the context of Japan, where charter planes that have been used by developed countries also taking, evacuating citizens of other countries as well. So in addition to IOM being enlisted to assist to evacuate citizens, some states have assisted citizens within their region to evacuate as well. Um, and so in that context, the point is that it's, it's meant to be a collective response. So where certain states or other stakeholders don't have the resources to be able to do it themselves, <coughs> there should be others who can step in and assist. Thank you, Sanjula. And, and coming, Thomas, to your first question, um, I think the key point of the summit was addressed to precisely what you were getting at, was to create a sense of solidarity and genuine um, collective commitment to addressing large movements of refugees and migrants and recognizing that um, as the Special Representative of Secretary General and International Migration, Peter Sutherland often said, that right now what we have is a situation where proximity determines responsibility. Um, but really, these issues are global issues and the full international community needs to be brought to bear to, to work on them and not just leave which countries surround a country in crisis as the ones who bear the responsibility. And I think UNHCR has a statistic where they said 80%, 86% of the world's refugees are hosted by developing countries. And their appeals for funding and support, um, and more, even more importantly, longer term solutions have gone um, not met. So one of the key um, aspects of this summit was to try to generate a commitment from the outset of a refugee crisis of the development community, including the international financial institutions like the World Bank, 
to provide immediate assistance to the hosting countries, to enhance their capacities, to relieve some of the burden, and to really create more of a sense of burden sharing, um, both at the, the initial phase, but obviously also when situations become protracted and not leave people languishing in refugee camps or in uncertain status for 20, 30 years, which unfortunately is the case in too many situations. On the migration question, so that that's really what it's about, and there's something that came out of the summit called a comprehensive refugee response framework with a view toward developing a global compact on refugees based on a notion of responsibility sharing and really saying this is a collective responsibility of the international community. The comprehensive refugee response framework was adopted. It looks at all phases of refugee um, uh, issues and measures that can and must be taken. The day after the UN summit, President Obama held a summit specifically on responsibility sharing for refugees, co-hosted by several other governments and the UN, that was a specific summit designed to secure concrete pledges of enhanced assistance, whether it's money to go to the countries that are hosting refugees or more resettlement spaces for longer term refugee populations to move into countries willing to take them, or a whole host of measures, but concrete ones. I think we've still got a long way to go on making genuine solidarity and responsibility sharing the way, uh, the way of the world, but that's really precisely what's necessary. Thank you very much. Any further questions and comments? Uh, the gentleman in front of me, and then we'll come to the gentleman on my left. Hi, my name is Rudy Konings. I'm in charge of policy for humanitarian emergencies at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome IOM to the UN family. I think it's a, it's a great uh, addition, and uh, we look forward to working together on a number of issues. My question is on the, the guidelines, um, and of course it's related to health. Uh, because that's one of the things if you ask migrants or refugees what are their concerns, health usually is in the top three of uh, what they are concerned about. Yet the guidelines remain surprisingly mum on the topic. And so issues like the right to health or essential packages of services or um, issues like that, um, are they wiped under the carpet or What's the view of IOM on this, um, and how does, does IOM see to address what we think is quite an important issue? Okay, Sanjula, you're on the spot. <laughs> no. You know, my husband works for the World Health Organization, so obviously I do understand those concerns. So does mine. <laughs> oh, so you get, you get an earful about this uh, every day, I presume. You know, what we try to do with the guidelines is to not reiterate existing frameworks, guidelines, and response systems that are already accepted. And to really try and articulate and highlight the types of specific vulnerabilities and needs that migrants have, and to then attune states and other stakeholders thinking towards understanding some of the unique vulnerabilities that migrants face. So in the context of a crisis, anyone who's affected may have health concerns or gender-related concerns or concerns around accessing basic subsistence and emergency aid. And all of those issues are captured under, under Guideline 12, which is talking about providing basic assistance without discrimination. But, but we mention health, we mention um, sanitation, we mention water in the context of specific practices that may have been implemented and the assistance that people need in the context of crisis are meant to be captured under that guideline. Because what we try to do is not pull out things that migrants may need in a similar way to citizens, but to highlight things that need to be done differentially for migrants. So the point is that lang migrants won't know the lang migrants may not know the language of a host 
host community or a host country. And that can create something of a unique barrier and constraints for migrants in terms of their ability to be resilient in the context of a crisis. Sometimes the disaster response frameworks or the emergency response frameworks in a country really focus on citizens and don't take into account that some migrants may be in an irregular situation. So if those frameworks better incorporated the presence and the specific kind of vulnerabilities of migrants, well, that's when responses are going to be improved. So I hope you don't think that we didn't, didn't think about health. We absolutely did. And those issues come up a lot in the types of practices that you'll find in the repository and in the types of generic practices that have been included. Um, but in terms of the principles and the guidelines, it was really trying to highlight the unique factors that make them vulnerable. Yeah, Michelle. Very briefly, just on IOM and not the guidelines, but um, the migrant health agenda is a really huge, hugely important one. And I think as an organization, you probably know we have a team dedicated to migrant health related issues, and they are focusing around the world about recognizing that certainly when people move, they they don't all have the same access to health and to quality health, and that their experience of health will be determined by a whole host of social factors that make their health needs different, and there need to be migrant-sensitive health practices and policies where people go. And so one of the, and we're certainly partnering very closely with WHO on, on the migrant health agenda, and not with a view to stop people from moving because of health-related issues, because, I mean, I think that historically that had been the way it was understood to try to prevent the transmission of disease by stopping the movement of people across borders, while recognizing now that that's just not realistic. People will move across borders, diseases will transfer across, and the real issue is preparing um, systems for the capacity to address uh, mobile populations and their particular needs. So that's a major, major um, agenda. And I actually think that will play out in the context of the Global Compact on Migration. There'll have to be dedicated uh, attention to that issue. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to the gentleman right in front of me. I'm also just going to, as this is a session dedicated to the work and activities of IOM, uh, we're fortunate to ha enough to have the representative uh, of IOM for Finland with us this afternoon. I'd like to ask him to think about whether he wants to add anything as to how the current migration situation is impinging upon Finland and the Nordic region. Has it affected you substantively? And if so, how? What is, what is the IOM response? But before inviting you to take the floor, I'll give the floor to our gentleman in the front. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sanjula. Yeah. Um, when you opened the session, uh, a statement caught my attention. And sorry, I am Jay Nanje. Uh, I am from uh, originally from Cameroon. I've lived in Finland for about ten years. I was trained in Helsinki in social services, and I work with uh, unaccompanied minors. I've worked with them for about nine years, and currently I'm taking a master's program in educational leadership. Two statements caught my attention this afternoon. First, you started by saying, Jeff, that um, as we sit in the comfort of this room, people are drowning now in the sea. Some are under fire right now uh, and are facing challenges that uh, are unimaginable. The second statement that caught my attention from Michelle was uh, she's looking forward to working with us. Um, I've had first-hand experience with migrants here in Finland. And uh, Sanjula made a point about uh, human rights, uh, recognition for human potentials, and respect for values. One of the values and the guidelines, the principles, if I understood correctly. So uh, they say in every rule there's an exception. Let's say the rule is we go to a seminar, we come up with reports, we uh, publish, uh, you know, journals and so on and so forth. I'm asking Michelle, I'm asking Jeff, could you use this opportunity as an exception when you said you're looking forward to working with us? 
I, for one, am very interested in working with you. I've put my application in the UN website, and you know the bureaucracy, it's been fruitless. I see this as an opportunity for me to practice and uh, apply the skills that I've gained to reach down to human lives and save them in a concrete way. Is there room for me to do something with you? Thank you very much. I've got to confess, I've spent most of my career writing reports that I'm not sure anybody, <laughs> anybody has ever read, let alone acted upon. Uh, but I'm going to avoid the question and pass it on to uh, Michelle, and then I'm going to invite our IOM representative here in Helsinki to say a few words. Thank you very much, Dave, for engaging, and I'm delighted to hear about your, your commitment here. One, one of the things that we are trying to do that, uh, at IOM is how to create more meaningful partnerships, and particularly with civil society organizations and create networks. We, we have our website where vacancy notices are posted. By all means, keep an eye on those. But we're never going to have nearly enough job openings to be able to bring in as many people as we would like to. So we need to find other ways to collaborate as well. Um, we have just had a, a new head of research join IOM at headquarters. And she's in the process of reaching out to look at creating networks and to see who's doing what in, around the world and how to really build synergies there. I'm happy to give you her name and put you in contact after this. Um, Simo, our head of office here in Helsinki, will be taking the floor in a moment, may be able to discuss with you opportunities for engagement here. But I do think this is one of our key challenges moving forward is, is how do we cultivate a community of interest and give meaningful opportunities to participate? IOM has been running civil society consultations for a few years, and but we recognize that they're necessarily limited by people who can fund their own way to come to Geneva but to participate, we need to maybe utilize technology as a way to be able to bring in more people and create more platforms for dialogue, discussion, and, and otherwise. My last point is related to that. I mean, with the MICIC initiative, as, as Sanjula mentioned, we created this repository of practices Part of the repository is drawn from submissions that people made for, to the website. So we've created a part that says share, share your experience, share your practice, so that people can give their ideas and suggestions for what could be done or is being done and needs to be shared more broadly. I think we need to use modern technology to, as, as a way to create more of a voice and more opportunities for real engagement and, and exchange. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn to the IOM representative here in uh, Helsinki. Uh, Finland's a relatively small country. It's geographically quite a long way from the world's hotspots. So how has uh, Finland and Helsinki and the, the Nordic region in general been affected by what many people are calling the current migration crisis? Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, yes, my name is Simo Kohonen. I'm the uh, head of uh, IOM office here in, in, in uh, Helsinki, Finland. Um, certainly, like you said, that Finland uh, Finland has and has been until until recently pretty much uh, away from the the big migration flows, and we haven't traditionally been the, the any any uh, large uh, immigration country as, as as such. And and then um, last year, when we were faced with uh, with an about ninefold uh, increase in, in in asylum seekers asylum applications, the country went of course kind of crazy. Uh, that, that that took everybody by surprise. It was uh, until until uh, still in the spring when people were observing what is happening in Europe and so on elsewhere uh, that uh, they will people they will never come to this way uh, th this far uh, was was bit the reaction almost quoting some some counterparts that that we also discussed and tried to sound, sound out their preparedness on to the to the issue um, this anyway happened and and what we what we've seen is is, is uh, what Michelle was discussing earlier and and uh, talking talking about the, the crisis in in um, uh, uh, we, in, in confidence and, and political cr level crises, and and on, on on there that we are we are really seeing have been experiencing that one, and, and there's been so many 
so much uh, um, anti-migration narrative, xenophobic uh, writings, uh, hate speech, etc. Uh, rise of, of uh, uh, different uh, anti-migration, uh, almost racist, uh, really racist, uh, almost ne uh, neo-nazist uh, movements. Now here, just uh, two weeks ago, one guy lost uh, lost his life, and there's big demonstrations uh, um, uh, across the country today, uh, just uh, saying that now this is enough and and finally like many political parties politicians are are now coming and saying it clearly that this it is enough of hate speech now and but the question is that do people really have to die uh, uh, in, in 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 fights on on, on streets that uh, that the politicians are have the courage to 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 say that enough is enough and and uh, this is I, I think uh, one one point another thing I think it's is this brings to the what, what you were just earlier saying, that the, the crises are so different. Um, we have this kind of political confidence crisis here, but I think then the, real the other real crisis is there when, when people really die in large numbers, when they, they try to reach, uh, and, and uh, they, don't have the, they don't have the regular uh, migration channels available, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, very many countries are, are tightening the uh, rules, regulations, policies, Making uh, even even the uh, even impossible to come then through the irregular channels, when when the conditions for getting asylum and and, and residence permits are tight and uh, conditions for family unifications are tight and limited, um, what are then the options? Then you don't have any other option than than uh, seek uh, seek smugglers, traffickers, and and that's it's just a vicious circle getting getting just further and further worse. Uh, worse, worse situation for the for those who are really in need of in need of uh, need to need to move and and, and escape uh, horrors. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any further questions and comments, gentlemen in the front? Yes, uh, this is a comment. Um, if we look at the world today, since nine eleven when uh, the U.S. coalition launched the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the, conf and the situation of refugees and uh, other calamities that ensued. And then we come over to the Arab Spring, starting with the emolition in, uh, in Tunisia and what is going on today. I mean, the world is highly unsafe. It's like there are crises everywhere. And it appears humanity is not able to manage the crisis. And we see a situation where it's like everyone is drifting away or running away from the real solutions. At times we have situations where the voices of the affected people is not heard. Decisions are made at the UN in New York and in other high bureaucratic places for people in some isolated part of the world who do not have any idea about, I mean, what is going on and all these kind of things. I think that for the world to be a safe place for all of us, we need to look at the root causes of conflicts. Why are there so many wars? Syria today, no one knows when the conflict in Syria is going to end. In Libya, it is the same situation. In Yemen, arms are in the hands of even children. In Central African Republic, it is the same situation. Across borders and so on, there's a lot of restlessness. Um, I think that we really, really need to address the root causes the Trump, even in the USA, if you, anyone who listens to all the things he says about his campaign, and in Europe, many of the countries, they are all going toward the far, far right to tighten the borders, to send immigrants back to their home countries, to cut development aid, that there are enough poor and homeless people, veterans in the USA. Why is money being given out? to take care of poor people in Africa. Is that our problem? It's all over Europe. In Germany, Angela, Angela Merkel is humanit uh, I mean, he's, uh, humanitarian, but there are others. She, her party recently lost the election 
to far-right movements that are growing all over the world. So I think that, like uh, the president of Turkey said in the United Nations, that there is need for reforms, even at the level of the United Nations, where the Security Council, since the Second World War, has remained the same. Five countries making decisions for the rest of the world. And this, in a way, has led to a lot of conflicts because when they vetoed that this country should be attacked, the country would, would be attacked. And in some situations, we have uh, 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 cases where the U.S., for example, can unilaterally launch a war against another country. So I think that if there are reforms like more representatives from every continent in the Security Council making decisions in a consensual way, and trying to see how we could stop the wars that are going on in the world. If we have that kind of approach, it's going to make the world a better place. If we don't approach, if we don't see things in this way, and we only wait for the conflicts to grow and grow, like in the Middle East where we have, I mean, Israel and the other Arab countries looking at each other like hawks, trying to rearm themselves every day and all the time, if we have that kind of tension in the world, the conflicts will grow and grow, and there'll be a time when I wonder if humanity will be able to address the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn that comment into a question. Uh, something I'm acutely aware of is that those of us who work on refugee and migration issues spend a lot of time talking to each other. And it's very rarely that I go to a meeting where I don't agree with everything that everybody says. <laughs> and taking up your comment about the far right and about people who are uh, not in favour of migration or, or providing asylum to refugees, um, I just wonder whether we should be engaging more with people of that school of thought. It's very easy to talk to people that agree with us. It's much more difficult uh, to talk to people who disagree with us. And I, I noticed uh, at the UN summit earlier this week that even there, some governments took the opportunity to make quite hostile statements uh, about migrants. I won't say which countries, but I think you can probably guess which ones they were. So, M Michelle, is there, are there ways in which we can engage with these uh, with these actors who are very important actors in the migration field but who don't necessarily start with the same normative assumptions that we have. I, I think that's a, a hugely important point, Jeff, and uh, actually one that you know I think we've I've been thinking about and, and IOM's been thinking about and struggling with. And, and I think we need to recognize that you know, we do live in a world of nation states, and as part of that, governments have a responsibility. Um, to their own populations, including to maintain their, their safety, their security, and their well-being. And, and therefore, the decision about which non-nationals come into their countries, for what reasons, for how long, it will remain a, an attribute of sovereignty related to those legitimate questions about maintaining the well-being of the populace. And when you have irregular migration, and certainly when you have large-scale irregular migration, it challenges that, that very ability of the nation state to make those judgments. And of course, unfortunately, where there have been very few but very prominent instances where there's been security-related um, concerns linked to that, it creates a conflation in the public mind of Governments lost control, and now we're being overrun, including by some people who have negative intentions with respect to our populations. So I think you, we have to, Jeff, I mean, in, engage and recognize the responsibility of governments to protect their citizens and the well-being of their citizens, and recognize that, but also um, engage them in a discussion that also makes clear that the overwhelming majority, I mean, in fact, you know, 99.999% of migrants and refugees coming in have not been linked to criminal activity, to terrorism, the to loss of jobs, that, that, that that's a really false equation. The numbers simply don't bear that out. So while recognizing their legitimate concerns, pointing out the fact that um, the refugees and migrants are not negatively affecting those concerns and in fact can help on some of those issues. And so to really change 
the debate around those to, to one that is more fact-based and recognizes their needs, their legitimate needs to ensure the, the health and well-being and safety and security of their populations, and then allow for, I hope, a longer-term discussion. Great, thank you. Well, our time is unfortunately up, so with that I'd like to thank uh, the audience for its very active engagement in this discussion, and more specifically to Michelle and Sanjula for two excellent presentations. Uh, I know they have to rush back to Geneva uh, a little bit later this afternoon, but I'm sure for the next few minutes, if you want to engage with them on a personal basis, I'm sure they'll be able to do so. So uh, thanks to our speakers, thank you again, and uh, enjoy the coffee break and the final plenary uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.